Hi, physiology students, and welcome to chapter two. Um, before we do chap part A of chapter two, which is on chemistry, I just want to remind you of what we'll be doing on Sunday this week. If you go to the module section, um, you can see here we're going to be going over chapter two this week. And on Sunday, you'll have a quiz on chapters one and two. So that's shown right there. I open it up on Friday, so it's open up the whole weekend. Um, and you can take that quiz due by Sunday at midnight. And then we have our first lab um, using the Labster simulation software. Um, be sure to use this in Google Chrome. So if you would just click on it, it'll take you to, it'll kind of give you an introduction to the lab and then you can load it in a new window. It takes a couple minutes for it to load and it really kind of causes your computer to run a lot because you're basically playing like a video game with a lab simulation. Um, and it, it will take uh, about an hour to an hour and a half to complete. So be sure to leave some time uh, to, loop, to you do this first lab. So that is also due on Sunday, February 21st at midnight. Um, with that, we'll go through part A of chapter two, which is on chemistry. Um, at the first part of each chapter, you have a little video connecting um, the information to a potential career. So you, I let you guys watch those videos on your own. So chemistry and physiological reactions, uh, your body is made up of many chemicals and chemistry is the underlying of all these reactions. So um, in terms of movement, digestion, pumping of the heart and nervous system, when we really break it down, um, it's all biochemistry and basic chemistry. So that's what we'll talk about in chapter two. So we'll first talk about matter, which is anything that has mass and occupies space. Matter can be seen, smelled, or felt. Weight is mass plus the effects of gravity. States of matter, these matter can exist in a solid, which has a definite shape and volume. A liquid has a changeable shape, definite volume, and a gas has both a changeable shape and volume. So an example of a solid, is a desk or the table that you're at, a liquid is the drink that you're drinking, and a gas um, is the air that you're breathing. Energy is the capacity to do work or to put matter into motion. Energy does not have mass nor it takes up space. And the greater the work done, the more energy it uses up. And this is a great animation um, showing energy concepts of potential and kinetic energy. So again, when you download the PowerPoint, you can watch those animations. Energy exists as kinetic, which is energy in action or motion, and potential is stored or inactive energy. So your drink cup on top of your table right now um, has potential energy because it's um, above and off the ground. And if I were to push it over, that potential energy would turn into kinetic energy or energy in action. Energy can be transformed from potential to kinetic energy and the energy will be stored upon release, resulting in action. There's different types or forms of energy. Chemical energy is stored uh, within bonds of chemical substances. Um, so all of the elements and atoms are bonded together. And um, the, within those bonds, we call that potential energy because when we break those bonds, energy is released. Um, energy can be electrical, which is resulting from movement of a charged part particle, so something with a positive or negative charge. Mechanical energy is directly involved in moving matter, and radiant or electromagnetic energy travels in waves, whether those are heat waves, visible light, ultraviolet light, or x-rays. Energy, like we talked about, can be converted from one form to another. Um, like turning on a lamp will convert electrical energy running through the circuit um, as light energy. Energy conversion is always inefficient, meaning some energy will always be lost, um, which can be partly re unusable energy. All matter is composed of elements and elements are substances that cannot be broken down into anything um, simpler. Um, so we call all the elements that we have um, in the periodic table. Um, there's four elements that make up most of our body. So these four elements make up about 96% of our body, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. 
um, about another nine elements make up the remaining about 4%. And then elements, um, about 11 of them make up the less than 0.01%. And the periodic table lists all the known elements. All elements are made up of atoms, which are unique building blocks for each element. So all elements will all be made up of the same kind of atom. They are the smallest particle of an element with properties of that element and what gives each element its particular physical and chemical properties are these atoms. So an atomic symbol, so in the periodic table, um, you'll see a lot of one or two letter chemical shorthands for each element, so kind of like an abbreviation, and this is known as the atomic symbol. So you'll see an O, which represents oxygen, and a C, which represents carbon. Some symbols will come from Latin names, um, like sodium. Um, in Latin is natrium. So you'll have an Na for sodium instead of an S, you might be thinking. Um, K comes from the Latin name callium, um, and that is for potassium. So instead of having a P for potassium, you'll have a K um, to mimic the Latin root of the word. Here are common elements composing the human body. Um, so oxygen makes up about 65% of our mass. Then carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen here are the four most common elements that make up our body. Um, and then you can read about the functions of where you'll find these most common components in the body. Here are more common elements. These are the lesser known elements that make up less than 4%. And you'll see um, their element name, the atomic symbol, which is again the abbreviation, and where it is um, found in the body. So I'll let you pause the video here and you could kind of read uh, those functions. And then these are trace elements. It just gives you a general list um, and kind of a general um, description. They are found in extremely minute or small amounts. Atoms then are composed of three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons carry a positive charge and they weigh um, about one atomic mass unit. So we say they weigh one AMU. Neutrons have no electrical charge, so we give them a zero. They also weigh about one atomic mass unit. And electrons carry a negative charge they are so extremely tiny that they have virtually no mass or no weight. The number of positive protons will always be balanced by the number of negative electrons. So atoms are always electrically neutral. So they're, unless it's um, an ion, there will always be the same number of protons as the number of electrons um, in an atom. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus. So in the center, we have the positive and neutral charged protons and neutrons. And electrons will always orbit around the nucleus in what we call a cloud. Um, and we call that the um, atomic electron cloud. Chemists have devised models for how these subatomic particles are put together. Um, we'll talk about the planetary model and the orbital model. The planetary model is the more simplified and outdated version because it incorrectly depicts the electrons um, traveling around the nucleus in orbits. Um, it says the electrons travel around the nucleus in a fixed circular path, much like the moon travels around Earth, um, but it's still useful for illustrations. What is more likely about how the electrons travel around the nucleus is the orbital model. So this is the current model. Um, there's just more of a probable region where an electron is most likely to be located rather than a fixed orbit. So the electron more travels um, kind of in a cloud around um, the nucleus. Shading in regions of greatest electron density results in electron cloud around the nucleus. And this is useful pr for predicting chemical behaviors of atoms. So this is a look at the orbital which model which represents the um, electrons as a cloud of negative charge around the nucleus. And that's the more, more accepted version of the structure of an atom. And a more simplified planetary model shows an electrons as two small spheres on a circle around the nucleus. So again, this is an outdated version of how an 
um, atom is structured, but we sometimes use the planetary model um, to show the levels of orbits of electrons or shells surrounding each nucleus. Different elements contain different numbers of subatomic particles. So hydrogen has one proton and one electron and zero neutrons. Helium has two protons, two neutrons and two electrons. And lithium has three protons, four neutrons, and three electrons. You don't have to memorize all this, but the periodic table gives you a way for understanding each element and the number of subatomic particles they have. Identifying facts about an element include its atomic number, mass number, its isotopes, and atomic weight, which you will all learn. So here shows the structure of the three smallest atoms, and it shows you how they are structured. So we have hydrogen with one proton in the middle and one electron out, so it has no neutrons. Helium has two um, protons and two neutrons in its nucleus and two electrons in its orbit surrounding. Lithium will have three protons and four neutrons in the nucleus and three electrons surrounding it. Again, you'll remember that the number of protons always equals the, um, equals the number of electrons um, and the number of neutrons can change in the nucleus. So the atomic number is always the number of protons in the nucleus and it's often written as a subscript, a little number to the left of the atomic symbol. So lithium has an atomic number of three, so that tells us the number of protons. The mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and this gives us the total mass of the atom, and it's written as a superscript to the left of the atomic symbol. So the atomic um, number for lithium is three, and the mass number is seven. Because you know the mass number is equal to the number of protons and neutrons, we know that there are three protons in lithium and there must be four neutrons because three plus four will give us seven, the mass number. Isotopes are structural variations of the same element. Atoms will contain the same number of protons, but they will differ in the number of neutrons they contain. So the atomic numbers are the same, but the mass numbers will be slightly different. And the average of all mass numbers for an isotope or for all forms of an isotope will form the atom. So here are the isotopes of hydrogen. Again, an isotope um, has different numbers of neutrons. So here's hydrogen one with zero neutrons. De deuterium um, has one neutron and one hydrogen and tritium has two neutrons and um, one hydrogen. So again, an isotope, everything's the same. There's just a different number of neutrons for each isotope. A radioisotope is extremely helpful in medical purposes. Um, it's an isotope that decomposes to a more stable form. So the atom will lose various subatomic particles. Sometimes the loss results in an isotope becoming a different element. As the isotope decays, the atomic particles that are being given off will release a little energy. And this energy is known as radial activity. And it can be detected and measured with a scanner, which gives radioisotope isotopes um, being a very valuable tool for biological research and medicine. So if you're still with me, um, you'll hear a little voice, and that's because I have my seventh month old um, son with me. So I'm sorry if that's causing a little bit of a distraction here. Um, so we are talking about radioisotopes being a valuable tool for biological research and medicine. They share the same chemistry as their stable isotopes. So they'll be always be taken up by the body and then they can be used uh, to diagnose a disease. All radioactivity can damage living tissue. So some types can be used to destroy localized cancers. So radio, um, um, you'll hear about radiotherapy being used uh, to fight cancer. Some types can cause cancer. Look, for example, radon from uranium decay can cause lung cancer. Molecules and compounds then. So now we'll talk about combining atoms. Most atoms, um, can chemically combine with other atoms to form molecules and compounds. 
And a molecule is just a general term for two or more atoms bonded together. And a compound is a specific molecule that has two or more different kinds of atoms bonded together. So for example, C6H12O6, that's just a compound molecular formula for glucose. And molecules with only one type of atom, like two hydrogens or two oxygen, are just called molecules. So a molecule is just one type of atom and a compound um, is two or more different kinds of atoms bonded together. Most matter exists as mixtures, which are two or more components that are physically intermixed. Three basic type of mixtures can be a solution, a colloid, or a suspension. And here's an example of a solution where solid particles will dissolve um, into a solvent. An example of this is mineral water. A colloid is when the solute particles are larger than in a solution and they'll scatter light and do not settle out. So an example of a colloid um, is like jello. And the suspension is when solute particles are very large, they settle out and they may scatter light. And an example of this is blood, um, whether it's the unsettled kind of sample taken directly out of, out of you in a settled version after it's been centrifuged down like we can separate out uh, and see the settled red blood cells. Uh, solutions are homogeneous mixtures, meaning the particles are evenly distributed throughout. And we have a solvent, which is a substance present in the greatest amount. It's usually a liquid. Uh, water is often called the universal solvent. And that the solute is the substance being dissolved. It's present in smaller amounts. So for example, if we talk about blood sugar, Glucose would be the solute and blood or plasma would be the solvent or dissolving substance. Solutions, a true solution are usually transparent, meaning you can see through them. So an example is air, a salt solution or a sugar solution. So if you dissolve salt or sugar in water, the water should still look transparent. Most solutions in the body are true solutions of gases, liquids, or solids uh, dissolved in water. Three common ways to express concentrations is in the percent of solute in total solution, which is how many parts of the solute are in 100 total parts of the solution, where solvent is usually water. So for example, 10 parts of salt to 90 parts of water would be a 10% salt solution. Another way to express a concentration is to measure it in milligrams per deciliter. Um, this is the kind of the scientific community acceptance. Deciliter equals about one one hundredth of a liter. And an example, um, normal fasting blood glucose levels are around 80 milligrams per deciliter. So you'll see milligrams per deciliter as a common um, concentration or a common measurement for solutions, especially when you're measuring levels of blood glucose or if uh, medical professionals are measuring other levels of something in your body. Molarity then is the number of moles of solute per liter of solvent of water. One mole of a compound is equal to its molecular weight. So for example, glucose has a molecular weight of 180. Um, so 180 grams of glucose added to enough water will make one liter is a one molar solution of glucose. One mole of any substance always equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of that substance. And that special number we call Avogadro's number. And if you've taken chemistry, you've probably learned a lot more about this. Molarities are so small that they can ex be expressed as millimoles. So molarity is just another way of measuring a concentration of a solute. A colloid is also known as an emulsion. They're heterogeneous mixtures, meaning the particles are not evenly distributed. You can see large solute particles in the solution, but they don't settle out. So it gives the solution a cloudy or a milky look. Some will undergo sol gel, so turning the solution to a gel transformation like jello. And cytosol of a cell, so the inner kind of fluid substances within the plasma membrane of a cell, and includes everything between the nucleus and the plasma membrane. Um, that is a, like, like a sol gel or jello type solution. And then a suspension is a heterogeneous mixture that contains large visible solutes that do settle out. 
So for an example of this is like water and sand. Blood is considered a suspension because if left in a tube, the blood cells will settle out. There's three main differences between mixtures and compounds. Unlike compounds, mixtures do not involve any sort of chemical bonding between components. Mixtures can always be separated by physical means like straining or filtering, and compounds can only be separated by breaking their chemical bonds between the element, between, between atoms. Mixtures can be heterogeneous or homogeneous, and compounds are only homogeneous. So a chemical bond then, chemical bonds are energy relationships between electrons of reacting atoms. Chemical bonds are not actual physical structures. Electrons will be the subatomic particles always involved in chemical reactions, and they determine whether a chemical reaction will take place, and if so, what type of chemical bond is formed. So a chemical bond is not a physical structure. It will be some sort of relationship or sharing of electrons. So we need to talk a little bit about the role of electrons in chemical bonding. Electrons can occupy areas around the nucleus that we talked about already. And we call these areas electron shells. So each shell will contain electrons that have a certain amount of kinetic and potential energy. So shells are often referred to as energy levels. And depending on its size, an atom can have up to seven electron shells. And shells can hold only a specific number of electrons. The shell closest to the nucleus will be filled first. Shell one can only hold a maximum of two electrons. Shell two holds a maximum of eight. Shell three holds a maximum of 18 electrons. And again, um, an atom can have up to seven electrons depending on its size. The outermost shell of electrons is always called the valence shell, and electrons in the valence shell have the most potential energy because they're farthest away from the nucleus, and these will be the reactions that are, um, or these will be the electrons that are involved in a chemical reaction. The octate, octet rule means rule of eight. Um, atoms will always desire to have eight electrons in their valence shell. So an exception for this are anything smaller um, that will not have eight electrons to begin with. So smaller atoms like hydrogen and helium will only want two electrons in shell one. Um, they desire to have eight electrons is a driving force behind all chemical reactions. Noble gases already have a full eight valence electrons. Um, so they are not chemically reactive. Most atoms do not have full valence shells. So atoms will gain, lose, or share electrons. And this will form bonds between atoms with other atoms to achieve a more stable arrangement of eight electrons in the valence shell. So this takes a look at chemically inert elements where helium and neon already have their valence shells complete. Helium has two electrons and that's complete. And neon and all of the um, gases have eight electrons in their valence shell already. Chemically reactive elements, such as the ones shown here, um, do not have their valence or outermost shell filled. Um, so they will go on to complete chemical reactions by sharing electrons. Um, and they will share the electrons in their valence shell to make a bond. There's three major types of bonds, ionic, covalent, and hydrogen. An ionic bond are where we have ions, are atoms that have gained or lost electrons and become charged. So if an atom gains an electron, they'll become more negative. If they lose an electron, they'll become more positive because an electron has a negative charge. The number of protons does not equal the number of electrons in an ion because the number of electrons have changed. An ionic bond involves the transfer of valence shells electrons from one to another, resulting in an ion. One will become an anion with a negative charge, so that atom has gained one or more electrons. And one becomes a cation, a positive charge, and that atom has lost one or more electrons. This attraction of opposite charges will then result in an ionic bond. 
So this is a formation of an ionic bond. A common one is showing sodium um, chloride. Sodium will have a positive charge. Chlorine will have a negative charge. They will form an ionic bond because um, the positive and negative will attract each other. And sodium chloride is just a fancy word for table salt. Most ionic compounds will be salts. When dry, their salts will form crystals instead of individual molecules. And then an example again is sodium chloride, which is table salt. So the crystals, the atoms make up a crystallized form. Um, so you get the crystals of table salt. If you look closely, table salt looks like crystals. Covalent bonds are formed by the sharing of two or more valence shells electrons to form, to, to, to form a bond between two atoms. So sharing two electrons results in a single bond. Sharing four electrons results in a double bond. And sharing six electrons is a triple bond. Covalent bonds will allow each atom to fill its valence shell at least part of the time. And there's two types of covalent bonds, polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. Um, here's a look at a reacting atom and how they will all kind of these four hydrogens will share their um, electrons with the four valence shell electrons in carbon. And they'll get this kind of cross like T structure of methane gas, which is CH4, meaning one carbon and four hydrogens surrounding it. Here's a formation of a double covalent bond, which will be two oxygen atoms sharing two electron pairs. Um, and this is a molecule of oxygen gas or O2. You can see how two pairs of electrons are bonded together. So we represent it with two lines for a double bond. And here's the molecule of nitrogen gas, which forms a triple covalent bond. So two nitrogen atoms will share three electron pairs. And the triple bond is shown with three lines between oh, atoms. Oh. A nonpolar covalent oh, bond yeah. is the equal sharing of electrons between atoms. And this results in an electrically balanced nonpolar molecule like carbon dioxide. Um, so it's linear, so symmetrical. There's one um, carbon in the middle and two oxygens bonded by double bonds. So we get a nonpolar molecule because it's linear um, and completely symmetrical. A polar covalent bond is an unequal sharing of electrons between two atoms, and this will result in an electrically polar molecule, um, meaning atoms will have different electron attracting capabilities, leading to an unequal sharing. Atoms with a greater electron attracting ability will be electronegative, and those with less will be electric positive. And the best example of this is water, H2O, Oxygen will be more electronegative, so it will exert a greater pull on shared electrons, giving it a partial negative charge, and giving hydrogen a partial positive charge. And having two different charges is referred to as a dipole. So here's carbon dioxide, um, and water molecules have different shapes as illustrated by molecular model, models. But here we are looking at water, which gives it a V shape because it's a polar molecule. Um, the oxygen end has a slightly more negative charge and the hydrogen ends have a slightly more positive charge. Um, so we call this a polar molecule and we represent the shape um, by making it look kind of like a V shape when we draw it. So here's a look, just a great comparison of all the types of bonds and how electrons are shared. Hydrogen bonds then are an attractive force between electropositive hydrogen of one molecule and electronegative atom of another molecule. Hydrogen bonds are not true bonds, they're more just a weak um, magnetic attraction, and they are very common between dipoles such as water, and this is what makes water a liquid. It also acts as an intramolecular bond which holds um, a large molecule together in a three-dimensional shape, and a big example of that is DNA that we'll talk about when we get there. So an animation of hydrogen bonds that you guys can download and look on your own. Um, so this is a look at a hydrogen bond, which is a weak attraction um, between water molecules. And you can see here how different H2O molecules are bonded together. The negative end of the oxygen is attracted to the positive ends of the hydrogen. And we um, are able to make water. 
This gives water really unique properties. Um, so for example, a water strider bug can walk on a pond because of the high surface tension of water, um, a result of the combined strength of its hydrogen bonds. Chemical reactions then will occur when chemical bonds are formed, rearranged, or broken. These reactions can be written in a symbolic form called a chemical equation. And chemical equations will contain reactants and products. Reactants are all the substances entering into the reaction together, so what you start with. And products are the resulting chemical end products, so what you end with. And the amount of reactants and products are shown in a balanced equation. We'll use compounds, which are represented as molecular formulas. So for example, H2O is the compound of water. C6H12O6 is glucose. And these compounds um, are represented as molecular formulas, giving, telling you how many atoms are in each. The subscript indicates the atoms joined by bonds. And the prefix denotes the number of unjoined atoms or molecules. So for example, 4H means you have four hydrogen atoms and one carbon. They are not bonded together at this point because they are the reactants. When you add them together and then you go past the arrow on the right side of the equation, we put them together. And then if you see a subscript, that means they've been bonded together now. So CH4 means they're all bonded together. Whereas um, the prefix, the four and the one, mean they're unbonded together. So these are two examples of a chemical equation. The reactants are always on the left side of the arrow. Then you'll see an arrow going in one direction where the products will be on the other side. Three main types of chemical reaction. We have a synthesis or combination reaction. It involves atoms or molecules combining to form a larger, more complex molecule. Um, this is used in what we call anabolic or building processes. So for example, we have A and B. We put them together, they're bonded together, and make a new compound called AB. Synthesis reactions are where we take smaller molecules, particles and they're bonded together to form larger, more complex molecules. So for example, we take amino acid molecules and put them together to form a protein. A decomposition reaction involves the breakdown of a molecule into smaller molecules or its constituent atoms. So this will just be a reverse of the synthesis reaction. This involves catabolic or bond breaking reactions. So if we take, um, and this is wrong, it should be the opposite. It should be AB breaking it down to A plus B. And we'll give you an example here. So if we take glycogen, um, it's broken down to release glucose molecules. So again, a decomposition reaction is taking something, um, a larger molecule, and breaking it down into its single constituent parts. And then an exchange reaction is also called a displacement reaction. And this involves both synthesis and decomposition, where bonds are both made and broken. So basically, we have a chemical equation here. Um, and we're just going to exchange um, parts to it. So A, B plus C, we change, exchange out the B and C to get A, C, and B, so new reactants. And here's another example of an exchange reaction, A, B plus C, D. We're going to exchange parts, so we'll get A, D, and C, B. So we've um, synthesized and decomposed something. We've broken and made new bonds. Exchange reacts. Reactions, um, an example is ATP transfers its terminal phosphate group to glucose to form glucose phosphate. And you can see that here, it's just exchanging molecules around. So this is an exchange reaction. In living systems, these reactions are often referred to as reduction oxidation or redox reactions because atoms are what we call reduced when they gain electrons and oxidized when they lose electrons. If you can remember that um, an electron is a negative charge. So if anything gains an electron, they'll be reduced because they're um, reducing, becoming more negative, and they'll be oxidized when they lose an electron, so becoming more positive. In this example of glucose being oxidized and oxygen molecules being reduced, this is the typical um, 
reaction of cellular respiration where we take glucose plus oxygen uh, to get out carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. And you guys will eventually memorize that reaction of cellular respiration, how your body takes in glucose to create energy. Energy flow and chemical reactions can be exergonic or endergonic. Exergonic means the net re release of energy it gives off energy, and endergonic results, reactions result in the net absorption of energy or using up energy. Exergonic reactions are catabolic and oxidative reactions, and endergonic using up energy are anabolic reactions. All chemical reactions are theoretically reversible, meaning they could go in both directions, meaning um, the product could eventually form the reactions again. Chemical equilibrium occurs if neither a forward nor a reverse reaction is dominant, and that is shown by a double-edged arrow. Many biological reactions are not very reversible because the energy requirements to go backward are too high where the products have already been removed. The rate of chemical reactions, so the speed of the chemical reaction can be affected by an increase in temperature, um, usually an increase in concentration of reactants, or particle size, smaller particles usually increase the uh, reaction rate. A catalyst can increase the rate of a reaction without being um, chemically changed or becoming part of the product. And an enzyme is a biological catalyst that we'll talk about in this semester. End of part A. Thanks for listening, even with my little helper here. I know you've heard him. Um, we'll do part B hopefully on Thursday in person. I will let you know that. And um, I hope you guys are all having a great week. Just a reminder again, quiz and lab due on Sunday.